The prophecy extremism of the 1980s also witnessed the rise of a more extreme form of premillennial dispensationalism. And that variety of futurism was Christian conspiracy theories with the coming of a new world order. The common thread found in all of these conspiracy theories is the belief in an all-powerful, secret, elite, globalist conspiracy that seeks to initiate a totalitarian new world government that would replace sovereign nations. The prime candidate to inherit the one world government title is the United Nations in New York City. The United Nations has not been trusted by the citizens of America since its establishment in 1945. Many people in the United States believe our government would betray our national sovereignty to the United Nations in order to create a new world order managed by a one world socialist government. Chief among the early conspiracy theorists was the John Birch Society that was founded in 1958. They are well known for their mantra get the U.S. out of the U.N. These conspiracy theories found fertile soil in Christian fundamentalist circles, and Christian conspiracies thrived. In the 1980s, these theories migrated into dispensationalist writing, and new world order conspiracies could be seen everywhere. Eventually, new world order sightings spiraled out of control with black helicopters and secret concentration camps being seen everywhere in the United States. Authors such as J.R. Church in Guardians of the Grail and Tex Mars in Dark Secrets of the New Age and presidential candidate and 700 club host Pat Robertson in his book called A New World Order all chronicled the concept of a new world order. All these theories traced the concept of a new world order back to the Knights Templar and the First Crusade. The secret organization that links the Knights Templar to the new world order of today is a secret society called the Priory of Sion, organized by Pierre Plantard that came to prominence in the 1950s. During the last two decades of the 20th century, Christian conspiracy theories used the Priory of Sion as proof of an ancient cabal dedicated to our destruction. In 1993, the Priory of Sion connection collapsed when Plantard confessed under oath in a French court that he fabricated everything concerning the Priory of Sion. The French court ordered Plantard to cease all activities related to promotion of the Priory, and he lived in obscurity until his death on February 3rd of 2000 in Paris. One of the linchpins of Christian New World Order conspiracy is a proven hoax. What will happen next? One might think that the collapse of the Priory of Sion might cause dispensational conspiracy theorists to rethink their eschatology, but it didn't. Probably the king of Christian conspiracy theorists is Jack Van Empe, who still sees conspiracies everywhere. Could worldwide conspiracies exist? Sure they could. But it's hard to distinguish fact from fiction when so much exaggeration is coming from the pages of these books. Each author must find greater conspiracies in order to sell books. So in the end, it's about money, ministry, and millennium fever.
Why should we be concerned about the various forms of millennium thinking? The answer to this question is both subtle and simple. Millennium fever has ferreted itself into the political issues that divide Christianity today. Why do we hear such competing voices coming from the Christian conservative right wing and the secular liberal left wing? The answer might have more to do with millennium history than you might think. Let me share two examples from the political quarrel seen in the United States today. Have you ever thought why America and England are such staunch allies of Israel when compared with France and the remainder of Europe? Generally, both sides of the Israeli debate are Christian. Then why don't both sides support Israel? To some, my observation may seem simplistic, but millennium nuances can be seen in worldwide political decisions. We cannot dismiss the influence Christianity has had on Western civilization. Countries often formulate political direction from the religious opinions of their people. The political history of the United States and England is a display of the influence pre-millennial Protestantism has had on both countries. The Belfort Declaration of 1917 is clear proof of the premillennialism fostered by John Nelson Darby in England. The cornerstone of Darby's dispensationalism was the creation of a national state of Israel, and Great Britain spearheaded this movement. John Nelson Darby brought his views on Israel to the United States and found fertile soil in Protestant fundamentalism. The political direction of America during the first part of the 20th century was dramatically impacted by the religious influence exerted by premillennial fundamentalism. Premillennialism strongly supports Israel because Israel is the centerpiece of dispensationalism. In continental Europe, premillennial dispensationalism had little influence. Predominantly, the cultures of these countries are Lutheran and Roman Catholic. They were influenced more by the amillennialism of Augustine than the premillennialism of Darby. Amillennialism views the book of Revelation as an allegory, not a literal description of future events. Therefore, Israel is not as important to continental Europe as the Palestinian cause. England and the United States supports Israel partly because of their premillennial view of the world. While continental Europe is not that concerned with Israel, partly because of the historical influence of amillennialism. The crux of this observation is simply this. Our view on the millennium will often dictate our worldview and our politics. One cannot argue the fact that America is engaged in a cultural revolution for the heart and soul of the American people. One point that often goes unnoticed is the influence pre- and post-millennialism has had on both points of view. The right-wing conservative opinion is being driven by pre-millennialism found in the evangelical and fundamentalist Protestant churches. This worldview accepts the biblical position that the inherent heart of man is predisposed to selfish evil desires. The premillennialist believes in sin and that sin is at the center of all human action. Only Jesus Christ can save humanity 
from utter destruction through his second coming. The left-wing liberal contingent is a little more difficult to define because so many different factions join together to form their opinion. But a secular brand of post-millennialism idealizes their political rhetoric. Simplistically, post-millennialism is an eschatology that believes that human effort can bring about a near-perfect Christian society with Jesus returning at the end of this golden age. In the latter part of the 18th century, during the Age of Enlightenment, Christian post-millennialism made the jump into secular thinking. Many of the humanistic philosophies that came from this era envisioned a future golden age brought about through human effort. A classic example of post-millennial absorption into secular society is the classless utopia envisioned by Karl Marx in his book called Das Kapital. One thing happened to post-millennialism when it made the jump into secular philosophic thinking. Jesus was removed from the equation and replaced with an optimistic view of humanity. Secular humanism does not accept the theology that the human heart is corrupt with sin. In their worldview, sin does not exist. The secular philosophies that came from the Age of Enlightenment migrated to American shores and embedded into the liberal and educated elements of American society. The political agenda being pushed by the liberal elements of American society is strongly influenced by the idealism of secular post-millennialism. These two millennial worldviews have engaged in political and philosophical battle for the culture of America. The final outcome has not been determined. Our cultural future is adrift in the foolishness of political correctness.